As we move from gathering to listening, our scripture reading today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verses 1 through 11. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places being long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks, foreigners will work your fields and vineyards, and you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named the ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, you will, receive, you will rejoice in your inheritance, and you will inherit a double portion in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make my everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make the righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wow, what a passage. Uh, Good morning, Antioch. Can we just pause and pray uh, in response to that? Ah, gracious God, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for speaking to us, for giving shape to our lives. Um, Thank you for speaking such a powerful word to us in the midst of all that is broken in this world and in our own lives. Um, Expand our vision of you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the other day I was shampooing my head uh, because we bald guys actually use shampoo and some of you guys are like, we do? Um, <laughs> consider it more skin care than hair care, but um, it does have its effect. Um, as I was shampooing my head, I was, was thinking about what, what it is that makes us humans unique among all of other creatures. And that there, are other thing, there are things that we as humans do that are similar to other creatures, but but there's, there are a few things that set us apart. Um, and we, we do have this unique role within creation as the image of God. Um, but the, you know, other creatures use tools to some degree and others have some form of language and others um, mate for life. But, but there's something that we do that is absolutely fascinating to me. Um, and we, we start doing it from a very young age. It is the source of our greatest uh, accomplishments, and it's also the source of our worst nightmares. And yet it, it's something that we do so often that we don't really think about it all that much. And it's our imagination. Human imagination sets us apart. Um, significantly. My mom tried to raise me without toy guns, but 
pretty much every stick that I found somehow became a rifle or a pistol as much as she tried to dissuade me of that. You and I have the ability to see inside our minds things that are not physically present. Things that are not physically present. We can see inside our minds. Uh, Whenever I do big projects around the house, uh, like remodeling a kitchen, installing wood floor, whatever, I, I, before I start the project, I have to be able to see myself doing every step of it along the way inside my head. You give a kid a doll or a toy or some Legos or whatever, and almost immediately stories start to emerge as they all take life and they start telling these stories. I'd like to do a quick imagination test for you. Um, uh, as a senior in high school, we, we often do these senior mosts, you know, most likely to succeed, most artistic. Well, I came in second in two categories. <laughs> First category was most shy. So imagine that one. And the second one was nicest hair. The bald jokes will keep coming. But by the way, um, Norse mythology, I really was really into it when I was a kid. And I loved Thor before all the Marvel stuff. But now my favorite is Balder. All right. Back to what I was saying before. So it, it's, it's truly amaz- amazing what we have with these imaginations. Uh, when I was doing hospice work uh, for a while, there was a patient that I would, would visit who um, would just be slumped in her wheelchair when I came to visit. But as soon as, as I said hi, she would, would um, come to life again. And we'd, we'd go sit, and she would... Um, she would talk about, we, we kind of played house together. It was, she would talk about all of the food that she was making and ask me how I was enjoying it. And so I just played along. But she was able to see in her mind things that were not physically present. Imagination is also the source of our greatest nightmares. I don't know what the monster under your bed was, But for some reason, mine was cobras. And I had this ability to jump far from my bed in the mornings to avoid getting caught in the back of my heel by a cobra in Los Angeles. (laughs) It's also the source of our anxieties, our anxieties about things that have not yet happened, but also, strangely, anxieties about things that didn't happen in the past. When I was a pastor, there was a man in our congregation named Al. Al was a World War II veteran. And there was, Al told me about this, this time when he was uh, in the Pacific Theater and they'd been told that um, there was very likely an assault by uh, the Japanese Navy on the island that he was, was on. And so he, he was, was told to, to dig in in the beach. And so he dug in and he made this, this cozy little pillbox uh, for himself. And then he realized there was no way out of it. And he had created this death trap for himself. Well, fortunately, uh, there was no attack. But 60 years later, Al was still reliving this moment of fear as if it was still possible for him to suffer because of it. Uh, Al was particularly good at anxiety. He told me he was an expert at building bridges over rivers that don't exist, which I think is a great image, also an exercise in imagination. In the hospital uh, where I work as a chaplain, I deal with people who have out of control um, anxieties. Um, they know that things aren't good because they're there at the hospital. Um, but their, their imaginations get loose and they imagine things getting worse and worse and worse for themselves. 
So a nurse calls for a chaplain. And I often talk with them about our imaginations, how amazing of a gift they are to us, and yet how tricksy they can be to us. How we can play games with them. Because our imaginations play games with us, we can actually play games with them. So if you struggle with that, I'd be glad to talk with you about that afterwards. There are things that we can do to play with our imaginations. But all of our greatest inventions, all of our most beautiful works of art, all of our romances, all of our hope, and all of our fears, they all arise from our imaginations, this, this blessing that is also a curse. On top of, of this, our imaginations, as unique as they seem to each one of us, they're not completely our own. So we're going to play a little game. I'm going to say a phrase, and you are all going to respond with the first thing that comes to your mind and say it out loud. Are you ready to play? All right. The happiest place on earth? Well done. All right, let's try another. Taylor? Oh, did you think I meant T-A-Y-L-O-R? I meant that person that makes custom clothing, but that's okay. <laughs> so interesting, um, the happiest place on earth. Um, who, why did we all say the same thing? Somebody got access to our imaginations. Listen to Psalm 84. The sweetest place on earth is your house, Yahweh of heaven's armies. My soul longs, famished, ravenous for the place where Yahweh is worshipped. Every beat of my heart, every cell in my body yearns for the God who explodes with life. I envy the sparrow at home in your house, the swallow nesting and raising her young near your altar, Yahweh of heaven's armies, my king, my God. Different imagination for the happiest place on earth. I love how, how the psalmist has seen this nest and all of a sudden his imagination's filled with like, oh wow, that bird has it the best because it gets to live close to where Yahweh is worshiped. So our imaginations are both uniquely ours. We have imaginations that are so different from one another, and yet they're cobbled together by all these many outside influences because each one of us is constantly, and I really do mean constantly, bombarded by all kinds of images and ideas from movies and songs and commercials and social media posts and articles and books and classes and sermons and TV shows and on and on and on. And they're all building inside of us imaginations of what the world is like, of who we are, of what it means to be human, of who God is, if there is one, or if there are many, what our bodies ought to look like, how we ought to spend our money and our time, what the good life is like, why things are wrong with the world, who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, what truth is, what justice is. From the kids show Bluey to Stranger Things to everything on the shelves at Walmart, and yes, to all the songs Taylor Swift sings, your imaginations are being created for you by others. Corporations spend billions of dollars every year to create our imaginations. So the reason why we sit here in rows of chairs week after week isn't so much to get tips on how to live the best kind of life. 
The reason above all other reasons that we gather around the word of God and hear somebody read it to us out loud and then they hear somebody else open it up for us is simply this, to create inside of us a biblical imagination. We need a biblical imagination. Inside it, in, in this world of crazy and contradictory imaginations, we need a biblical imagination. We need the world inside of our minds to be scripture shaped, to be Jesus shaped, to be cross shaped. And this is the reason why our church encourages personal Bible reading, not because it helps us ascend some spiritual ladder, but because we need to be taking in the scriptures on our own on a regular basis. And it doesn't matter how much or how little, we just, there just needs to be some continual diet. Um, this is the reason why we encourage something like trips to the Holy Land. Um, I went to Israel when I was uh, 11, and it's amazing how ever since my whole life, I've had this ability to see many of the places that I read in my mind as I'm reading the scriptures. So when that becomes possible again, I encourage you to do that. This is why we have a church library just outside over here. It's not, it's not huge, but the books have been specifically picked for the sake of building inside us a Christian biblical imagination. That's why we have a book of the month to shape this in us. All of this contributes to a biblical imagination. Eugene Peterson used to say, when you hear the word biblical, don't think of a book. Think of a world, a world that is deeply suffused with God, where a consumerist American imagination tells us to follow your heart. A biblical imagination hears Jesus say, take up your cross and follow me. Our culture tells me that the God that I ought to bow down to is the unholy trinity of my wants, my needs, and my feelings, whereas a biblical imagination tells me that my life is baptized into the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's a long introduction to a short sermon. <laughs> Finally, Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 requires of us a biblical imagination, but it also helps build into us a biblical imagination as we read and meditate on it. Isaiah 61 was initially written uh, to a group of people who had experienced war up close and personal. And much of, of this chapter references um, the devastation of war that was not only a part of their past experience, but was a part of their current reality because they lived among the devastation, the ruins of war. Uh, even though the fighting was past, the devastation and destruction remained and it dominated their imaginations because it was around them. It, it, it created their, their imaginations about God, about themselves and the rest of the world. The first time that I read through the passage in preparation for this a few weeks ago, I realized that I was reading all the war imagery as metaphor. Uh, metaphors are good. I mean, it's the reason why Star Wars fans say, metaphors be with you. <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> uh, my kids will be at the next service. They will, they will give me grief for that. Um, but before we read the passage as metaphor, I think we need to read the reality of war into it. Um, we need to let that reality soak into our imaginations first. And this, this is harder for us as Americans because living in North America, we live 
far away from the front lines of war. Um, it was almost five years ago that Matthias and I went to New York and went to um, where the Twin Towers had been. But even then, it's a memorial. There's no rubble there. Um, so let me reread the first part of the passage. I'm not going to reread the whole thing. But, um, and I was going to include uh, images from several of the wars going on around the world right now um, that are um, images of these specific things. But, but as I was gathering these, I just became really sad. It's really heavy what's going on in the world right now. So I think I will leave that aside and we'll just, we'll hear the words and I'll, I'll make some comments as we go through. So Isaiah 61, the first few verses. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And there's a lot of reasons why people are poor, but war is really good at creating poverty. A week and a half ago, I read that something like 60% of the homes in Gaza had been destroyed. Just think about that. And that was a week and a half ago. I'm sure it's much more now. Just imagine two-thirds of the homes in Central Oregon being destroyed. War creates poverty. Uh, continuing, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. I don't know if you remember the, the Vietnam War song by uh, Edwin Starr called War. He says, war, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. It ain't nothing but a heartbreaker, friend only to the undertaker. Continuing, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness from the prisoners. These are the POWs, the prisoners of war. There was actually a pause in the fighting in Gaza as Israel and Hamas exchanged hostages and prisoners. Continuing to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. This references this, this year of the Lord's favor, uh, the year of Jubilee established in Leviticus 25, which is a whole sermon on its own. So I won't, won't go into it uh, much here. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion. War is the source of so much grief. If you Google war, you'll see a bunch of soldiers first, but then you'll see pictures of women and children crying. Continuing to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. In the ancient Near East, when, when loved ones died or there was a national catastrophe like war, people would gather ashes from the place where they cooked and they would pour them on their head. So the image of a crown of beauty instead of ashes on the head. And they would stop putting olive oil on their head and their hair, if they had it. Hence the oil of joy instead of mourning. And they would rip their clothes. Hence a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. War is devastating to the environment. So we have these oaks instead of trees cut down. And then finally, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore places long devastated. 
They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Everywhere around them, there were the ruins of war, constant reminders, influencing their imaginations, their eyes telling their hearts. Okay, so I've emphasized the imagery of war in this passage, but but did you notice what Isaiah was doing? How he was turning things around. So just a little aside, um, if you know me, you know that I love the book of Psalms. And one of the things that is throughout the book of Psalms is what Walter Brueggemann calls the inversion. Things are upside down, they're inverted from how they ought to be. And when the world around us gets inverted, so too does our relationship with God and so too do the words that we speak to God. So if all things were as they ought to be, the basic language, language that we would speak would be praise and thanksgiving. That would be with all of our relationships because all things are good and all things are beautiful as they were intended to be. And so would be our, our words with God. But what happens when things get turned upside down, the way we talk with God also gets turned upside down. And so we end up telling God to do things. That's not how we should speak with God. But when things are upside down, we say things like, God, can you get busy? Can you take care of this thing? Uh, in fact, uh, in the Lord's Prayer, which we said earlier today, um, I don't know if you noticed, but almost the entire prayer is imperative. It's command language. Give us this day our daily bread, because we need it. Forgive us. Um, Even your kingdom come is imperative language. So when things get upside down, so too does our relationship with God. And what Isaiah is doing is he's turning things back right side up. Good news to the poor. Binding up of the brokenhearted. Freedom for captives. Release from darkness for prisoners. Comfort for the mourning. Provision for the grieving. Beauty instead of ashes. Joy instead of mourning. Praise instead of despair. Rebuilding, restoring, and renewing devastated and ruined cities. As Isaiah does this and continues to paint an amazing picture of what the great reversal will look like in the rest of the chapter, because that's what he'll do for the rest of chapter 61, and I'm not going to go into that. What's he doing as he does this? He's creating a new imagination for the people. What they see around them has filled their eyes and their hearts. The ruins of war have created a war-ruined imagination inside of them. And the poverty of war has created a poverty mind in them. They hadn't rebuilt because they didn't have an imagination for what could be. They couldn't see beyond the ruins of war that that were in front of their faces day after day. But Isaiah is painting a picture for them with his words of a world that can be, a world beyond the ruins. He isn't showing them something that's currently physically present at least not yet. So friends, this is what we do when we read the Bible on our own and when we hear it here um, and when we listen to sermons and when we read books that are steeped in this biblical imagination like Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia and I'm going through um, finishing up um, Lord of the Rings right now and I'm just, it's so filled with this biblical imagination. It's what you and I need to do so much 
Otherwise, we will fall for left-wing and right-wing conspiracy theories. We will fall for prosperity gospels. We will fall for do-it-yourself spiritualities. Isaiah wanted to spark hope in the people, people who had devastated imaginations. And so our first question that I think this asks me and all of us is where is my imagination broken? Where is it that I see only darkness and not light? Where have I failed to see in my imagination where God is present in this world and in my life? Because the key to this imagination is, of course, God. If there is a God, if this God is active in the world, if this God has a goal that he's striving toward, and if this God's goal is good, if this God is inviting us, you and me, to participate in this good goal, and if this God cannot be stopped, then this is a powerful imagination to embrace, to foster, to live into. It is one um, that can stand up against all, all sorts of adversity. It can persevere. It's one that can stand against just the, the paltry, self-centered, follow-your-heart imaginations of our culture, which are so weak and fall apart so quickly. It is one that will not get co-opted by political parties or flash-in-the-pan movements. It is one that ignores the flavor of the month, holding out for the year of the Lord's favor, for the year of jubilee when wrong is turned to right, when the tears are wiped away from the eyes, when justice rolls down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. And Martin Luther King Jr. got that in his biblical imagination from Isaiah, uh, from Amos chapter five. Just listen to his speeches. They are filled with a biblical imagination. So friends, a biblical imagination tells us this, that against everything our eyes tell us, that baby born in a manger is actually the king of the world. Against everything our eyes tell us, that man hanging on the cross is actually the way, the truth, and the life. Against everything that our eyes tell us, the empty tomb is a down payment on the resurrection to come. Against everything that our eyes tell us, the bits of bread and the cup that we dip them into are appetizers to a feast beyond all feasts. Against everything that our eyes tell us, this awkward group of people sitting around you are in fact the glorious children of God. They are the community of the Spirit. They are an outpost of heaven right here in Bend, Oregon. Friends, we need to see with different eyes. For the kingdom of God is, in fact, breaking in all around us at this very moment, if we only have the imagination to see it. To see beyond the ruins around us, to see beyond the ruins in our own lives, to see our unstoppable God at work and beckoning each one of us to join him in it. Pray with me. Here you are, Lord, with us, doing amazing things right now. 
Help us to see. To see with the eyes of our hearts. To see you. To see what you're doing. And to see our part in it all. Amen, amen.